Hi there and welcome to Central Texas Gardener. I'm Tom Spencer. As our perennials wind down for now, it's time to fill in the blanks until they join us again. Today we get a new perspective from a transplanted British gardener who explains how she tackled Texas, including winter color against native evergreens. On tour, let's meet a family that pitched in and created a garden of memories. When Dawson and Leanne Clark built their home in Round Rock, they also built a garden of family memories with their children, Drew and Amy, and their dogs, Jenny and Abby. They wanted to give their outdoor rooms the same attention they gave the ones inside. We moved in in November of uh, 2003, and at the time, uh, when, we, when we bought the house, it was nothing. I mean, the native trees were here and there was no grass. And we had worked with a landscape firm in Temple where we moved from some good friends of ours named Mike and Kay Lynch on a firm up there called Earthscapes. Mike and Kay also designed a split level deck around the trees. And it's spring and the fall, of course, when the weather's at its prime here in Central Texas. We, uh, we grill almost every night. We um, eat on the, the, the deck. We spend time outside and just uh, really have loved uh, experiencing the garden and being outdoors in that way. And then from there, uh, Leanne and the kids and I began uh, just inserting things and like every gardener we tried some things in one place that didn't work and we've moved things around and done all kinds of things since then. It's been a real adventure. We've loved every minute of it. As the garden matured, it dictated some of the changes. The landscape architect that did the initial design uh, commented when she was here the very first time she visited the site that we would be amazed how quickly these native elms would, uh, would grow once the garden began to be fertilized and irrigated and that certainly has been true. Uh, when we planted the garden there were uh, many areas that were in full sun so we initially planted a lot of uh, sun loving plants and uh, we are slowly but surely losing a, a big portion of those sunny areas and uh, they're being transformed to areas with a lot of shade. But as a result, there's a spot for hostas, including some Dawson once carried in a suitcase from a colleague's garden in Pennsylvania. Because of their story, I dug them from the garden and temple and brought them with me here and they have absolutely loved the garden here in Round Rock. So there's just something about the soil here that they love. It's been an interesting challenge to keep things um, in, the, in the right spots uh, based on the, the light needs. Okay, most gardeners are always digging and moving and replacing plants, so it's been fun to, to do that. And, and really has given me an opportunity to take the hostas that I love so much and to kind of spread them around um, a little further. Along with planting, the family pitched in all hands for toolbox projects. My son Drew has been really kind of my right hand guy in the garden uh, for the, the major projects. We built the fountain. I had scavenged some uh, limestone from a, uh, it was abandoned from a construction site um, in the neighborhood. So we uh, broke up that stone and created a, a pathway around that, uh, the fountain, which we've really loved. And um, it's just so nice to sit on the deck and listen to the water splashing over the, the edge of that, uh, that fountain. In fact, the neighbors even can hear it and they, uh, they talk about how much they enjoy sitting outside. And, um, listening to our, our fountain splashing in the backyard. Everyone in the family enjoys Dawson and Drew's arbor and porch swing. Father and son also built the pathway for the garden shed.
we built all of that together. We've really had a good time doing it. He's uh, going to be a senior in high school next year and will be leaving, so uh, it's been nice to uh, have those things together and to enjoy them. The stepping stones that Drew and Amy made a few years ago made family history too. Dawson picked up their creativity with his mushrooms out of stones. The gardens also connected to family with the 1800s ice cream table that Leanne's grandparents found and restored in the pharmacy and soda shop they owned from the 1930s to the 1950s. Dawson's grandmother, Leatrice, contributed daylilies that grew in her garden 50 years ago. For the Clarks, layers of collected history turned a new backyard into a family time capsule. You know, some people are lake people, and some people are out big sports families, and they play all of the sports and things like that. And uh, really, our family has just been uh, kind of a garden family. Uh, I mean, don't get me wrong, my son still loves to play sports, and he, he loves basketball with his buddies. But uh, the, the thing that we have done through our married life and uh, have, have really enjoyed uh, doing on our weekends is just to kind of piddle around um, in the garden outdoors. And when we moved here and had this completely blank slate to start from, it, it really was a, a wonderful challenge and a, and a great experience for us to, to just uh, put this together. It's always great to see a family gardening together. And right now we're going to be putting things together for winter color. And I'm joined by Alexandra McBrearty. Uh, That's right. Uh, from uh, Color Spot Nursery, where you work, is a big garden wholesaler here. Very famous in the nursery trade for growing lots of big, colorful plants. Mm -hmm. And you've been worked as a garden designer and obviously a garden enthusiast. So it's great to have you on Central Texas Gardener. Thank you. It's great to be here. Well, we're going to be talking about brightening up the winter landscape and uh, mixing things up too. Uh, I think a lot of folks are used to using annuals in their in their uh, landscape during the winter time, mm -hmm. but uh, you advocate uh, mixing annuals with some of the bold texture, sometimes native plants. Absolutely, like the agaves and the um, yuccas and things the yuccas, like that. Things like that. They all give a, a lot of color. Mm -hmm. they, they sit there all winter and then you can surround them by per perennials in the summer and mm -hmm. easy, low maintenance all, all right. the time. Well, you, in addition to working with plants, you, you are something of an artist. I want to show some of the things that you've brought because you have some beautifully decorated containers that you've done all the painting and ornamentation on, right? Yeah, it's kind of a hobby. Uh-huh. So. And this is how you spend your evenings. When this you... is how I spend my evenings when I get home from work. I uh, grab one of the pots, I paint it up, and bring home some of my goodies and put them in. Well, so. well, uh, we have uh, beautiful uh, pots to show and uh, and also some really nicely mixed uh, can, uh, plantings to show as well and give people an idea of what they can put in the ground during the winter time. The first container that we're going to show and kind of highlight here, Alexandra, uh, a beautiful ornamentation by the way, love that. Um, and the beading is really cool as well. Yeah, it catches the light really yeah. well. So when the a light in the evening hits mm -hmm. it or the sunlight hits it, kind of glimmers. Oh, that's so. cool. And in this particular planter, we have, um, I see a golden euonymus, mm -hmm. uh, beautiful yellow pansies, and some little purple Johnny jump ups, violas. Yeah, violas, and some hedera helix, the ivy, right. which just gives it a little bit of a, a spiller. So. Okay. But I love the purple and the yellow together. I yeah. think that's a great combination. It's one even of though my I favorite have, combinations yeah. in the garden. Even though I have no yellow or purple in the pot, but somehow mm. it seems to go. Yeah, well, this is, a, and again, don't be afraid if you're putting things in a container or uh, creating beds of mixing evergreen plants with uh, your annuals. Uh, it really makes things pop out. And these, we, You this, know what else I love is putting a container like that in a bed, say a perennial bed, mm -hmm. where you just have a few evergreens in it mm -hmm. in the winter. Pop one of those in the middle of the border. It adds a splash of color. It doesn't just have to be right by the front door. There you go. So. Perfect. Right next to it, we have another one of your creations. And uh, I really am fond of the Yucca family. And this is the yucca pendula, the soft yucca. And a, a couple different varieties of viola and pansy in there as well, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, absolutely. The same kind of thing mm -hmm. all over again. Yeah, and, uh, and you can see 
it, uh, the really beautiful form of, of the yucca and how just having a little bit of softness around it really kind of plays it off well. That's actually the tropical yucca, so mm -hmm. occasionally it can get a little bit nipped mm -hmm. in the winter, but just a teeny bit, and yeah. just snip it off with a pair of scissors, good to go. Yeah. Well, uh, the next one, it looks like a Christmas basket to me. <laughs> Does it? <laughs> Cyclamen always looks like Christmas to it me. Does. And, and, uh, but th this is, a, this is a, a really wonderful combination. And here's another great color combo tip, silvers and reds. Silver and red, it just looks like Santa Claus. So. Mm -hmm. Well, beautiful container once again. Uh, this is really lovely. And inside the pot we have, I mentioned Cyclamen. What else do we have in here? You've got the Dianthus and Dusty Miller. Uh -huh. Good old-fashioned favorite. Well, in fact, they're all good old-fashioned favorites. Right. Nothing fancy, just mm -hmm. good garden plants. Well, we're going to talk a little bit more about Dianthus. I absolutely am crazy about the Dianthus family, but I think that's just a, a perfect color combination. And again, very seasonal look. Something that this I would put by the front door. Yeah, it, it would look good Yeah, if you've got a nice front door. Front door, <laughs> if you're having people over for the holidays, of uh, having a party, this is a perfect way to welcome your guests. Mm -hmm. And opposite that, uh, you have uh, uh, done a similar kind of planting, and again, beautiful container. Yeah. Uh, and this, uh, the centerpiece of this is an evergreen holly called Sky Pencil, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, and you know what's great for that also is because we are coming up to the holidays, is you can just get a little string of 10 lights, something mm -hmm. like that. They cost about a dollar at the dollar store. Wind them right. round, battery operated, tuck that in the, the pansies or the, mm -hmm. the cyclamen, and almost like a Christmas tree in the middle of your pot. Yeah, that's great, that's great. And so again, the similar theme, we have some cyclamen, some pansies, And the huca at the front gives a little uh, splash of right. purpley Heuchera. red, which you can also match up with pansies. And mm -hmm. So you've got the same kind of thread of color going through. That's uh, really a lot of fun to look at. Now, I, I want to mention that you know we, it, we talked about mixing in uh, uh, some of the hardy southwestern kinds of plants. Mm -hmm. And this is a plant we haven't we haven't really talked about th these kinds of yuccas before. These are yuccas. They do have a sharp tip, yeah. but they're th it's a softer foliage. It's not as stiff mm -hmm. as you would expect. And this is called Bright Edge. I think this bright one. Bright Edge, yeah, uh, very popular. It mm -hmm. flies off the shelves when we bring it in. Mm -hmm. It is a little sharp at the ends, yeah, a little but bit. It, it won't kill you if you no, fall on no, it. So no. it, won't, it won't impale you. No, not at all. And. Um, the color that you get along the, uh, this one has got the color along the perimeter, mm -hmm. and there's another form that has a center stripe. Yeah, they, they stripe different ways, a lot of them. Right, and uh, now I want folks to imagine this with uh, lots of color around it, because mm -hmm. I'm thinking that you can mix in things like the dianthus, and then I want to come back to this plant family just a bit, because we all know about pansies uh, for winter color. But I am, I'm a, I am really sold on the dianthus. These are tough plants. Me for... too. You just pop them in and ignore them. And this, even though it's a, an annual mm -hmm. variety, it's going to give you a good couple of years before yeah. you have to pull it out. The quickest way to kill it, probably mm -hmm. to overwater it. Exactly. And mm -hmm. in fact, there's uh, some varieties of this uh, the, the, with the, the gray foliage. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I mix with things like the yucca in my garden and never water during the no, summertime. Just sit back and... Admire. Yeah, you're right, and, uh, and the color forms on these annuals are just amazing. They are. They're almost I'm... edible. They're so <laughs> delicious. <laughs> really, really big on those. Now, we have a group of plants over here that are greens, largely, but uh, colorful greens. They are, and you know, you can put those, the, the kales and the cabbages and the Swiss chard, if you want more of a, a, a regimented bedding, perhaps, mm -hmm. you can go one after another after another with something more colorful in between. And mm -hmm. of course, the kale and the cabbages, and um, they give you great spring flowers. Sure. If you leave them in long enough, they, they give go you, to, yeah, they go to, they go to uh, seed. Go to seed and they get those cones with yeah, the flowers. And they look very great, bizarre. Yeah. yeah. So if you can leave them in long enough, they look great even in the spring. And they go right through the winter time, mm -hmm. no problem whatsoever. I love all the plants in that family. Um, Here's a plant that I, I have always admired, and you know I think the Camellia japonicas here in Austin may be a little tricky, but the Camellia sasanqua, which is another form, autumn blooming and winter blooming, mm -hmm. um, are really great container specimens for us. They are, and if you put them in a container, they're so much easier to give them their 
mm -hmm. required soil. Right. So the acid loving, you can buy a bag, it's not a huge deal to find it. Mm -hmm. And you can also feed them. You can find azalea exactly. and rhododendron and camellia foods. So. Mm -hmm. and very easy to take care of. Mm -hmm. I just give them a little liquid seaweed with uh, iron and then regular fertilizer. Yeah. And they do terrific. This is a variety called Bonanza. This has got a kind so. of a, a shrubby form. Some of them are weeping almost, mm -hmm. and some are very upright, like the Yuletide, yeah. which is a great plant. Yes, it one is. of my favorite in my garden right now, actually. About to about to go to town. It's, uh, I think it's going to have 500 blooms on yeah, it. Yeah, I would doubt it. You brought a, a group of plants for the shade as well, mm -hmm. and this is a, a, a nice little grouping of different textures and different colors to, to lighten up uh, shady spots. That's right. The Aztec grass, you can't go mm -hmm. wrong with. It, it really doesn't care what you do. You stick it in the ground and it just sits there yeah. looking colorful and variegated. Uh, the, the cyclamen, which mm -hmm. you call cyclamen, mm -hmm. um, again, gorgeous. And I've actually been able to keep them in the shade for a couple of years. Mm -hmm. Now, that doesn't happen often, no. but occasionally, <laughs> no. occasionally you can. Right. And then next to that, I think we've got the salsify, right. commonly known as the oyster plant, mm -hmm. which is used a lot in... Um, really colorful, I like yeah, that. Yeah, it, it looks like a wandering Jew. It mm -hmm. looks like but, it would yeah, be... Yeah, it's in the same plant family, yeah, right? Yeah, it looks like it would be um, tender, mm -hmm. but it's hardy down to 20 degrees. That's great. So again, the foliage might get a little nipped mm -hmm. if we drop really low for quite a long time, mm -hmm. but that doesn't happen that much. Not too much. So risk it for a Swiss kit. Yeah, well, great grouping. And, uh, you know, one thing about the Aztec grass, too, I, I will say, is that in the summertime, it really cools the landscape mm -hmm. down, the, it does. the variegated form. When we get all hot and heavy. Well, uh, this is uh, lots of great ideas here, lots of great winter color, and we really do appreciate you coming on board and sharing uh, your talents and your co color vision with us. So thanks so much. Thank you very much for having me. It's all been a great pleasure, and uh, we'll look forward to seeing more of your all the great stuff you have from Color Spot and the nurseries over time. I'll bring it in. Coming up next, it's Skip. Hello and welcome to Down to Earth. This week's question regards African violets. In fact, it's kind of a set of questions. How do you propagate them and how do you repot them and care for them? African violets can be repotted quite easily. In fact, you'll notice if you've had one for a while that as it grows, the neck or stem of the plant gets taller and taller and it really grows up over the, the surface of the pot. You can take those and remove them from the pot, cut away any extra soil around the outside and reset the plant down lower so that the lowest leaf on the stem is about at the soil level. Sometimes that means cutting a little bit off the bottom of the root pall or putting it in a little bit larger pot if you need to, but generally speaking, we don't like to put African violets in too large of a pot. It just creates problems for them in terms of overwatering. Reset it down with fresh soil. You can put that soil up around the neck and it'll be fine to take off and continue growing well. Now, as far as propagating them is concerned, they're very easy to propagate. It's one of the plants that can be propagated from leaf cuttings. You simply break a leaf off and set it down in the edge of the soil. You take the broken end of the leaf and set it down just a quarter of an inch under the edge of some moist potting soil. Put it in a moist chamber. You can use a clear plastic bag over a pot or you can use one of the clear containers such as you might buy cookies or cake in at the store as your potting medium. If you want to use potting soil, that's fine, but you can also use fresh perlite or vermiculite. And new plants will start to form at the base. That's why we don't want to shove that leaf down into the soil too deeply, because right at the base is where the new set of plants will appear, as you can see in the picture. And then you simply cut them away as they root and repot them up, and you've got several new plants to go from an old one. If you know someone who has an African violet you're really fond of, you can ask for just simply one leaf, take it home and do that kind of cutting and it'll be just fine. This week's featured plant is even African violets. African violets are a good winter plant. If you love gardening and when the cold weather arrives, we kind of get driven indoors a little bit. Uh, African violets are a great way to continue gardening on into the winter. Uh, this fall, the African Violet Society had their sale and that's an annual event. A lot of people get inspired as African violets appear in area nurseries this time of year too. Uh, you, there's so many varieties to choose from, from full-size types to dwarf types. There's some with variegated leaves. 
different bloom colors, some with solid blooms or ruffle blooms. For success with African violets, you want to make sure they have even moisture. I like to use the pots that have a wick that pulls moisture up from a reservoir below because that keeps you from overwatering them. If you keep the soil soggy wet, they'll rot and not do well. They like a bright light, but they want an indirect light. So don't allow the sun to shine directly in the window for very long under your plants. It's better to have an indirect light. They'll even do quite well under a uh, grow light if you'd like to grow them that way. But a very bright indirect light for success with them. And then feed them gradually. Mix up a soluble plant food so that they're constantly fed over uh, each time they draw a little bit of moisture up at a very low concentration rate and they'll do well. Out in the garden, it's time to collect leaves. As those leaves fall, take advantage of that free organic matter. There's a lot of nutrients in the leaves. That's how forests and meadows get fed, is from the tree and grass leaves that fall to the surface and decay away. If leaves fall onto your lawn, you want to remove them because leaves sitting on the lawn will shade it. And during the cool season, when the trees lose their leaves, our lawns continue to draw a little bit of sunlight from the sky. And so a covering of leaves smothers them and will really cause your lawn to go backwards. You want to mulch any tender perennials that you have and if you've got flowers and vegetables for the cool season continue to feed those about every four to six weeks. By continuing to feed them in small amounts over time you'll have good production and growth whether that production means vegetables or flowers. For more information or to find a way to get in touch with the county extension office in your area visit klru.org ctg. Thanks, Skip. Now let's check in with Trisha Shirey for Backyard Basics. One of the challenges that gardeners face, especially in the spring and the fall, as we're putting out new transplants and planting seedlings, are pill bugs and sow bugs. Now these are actually not insects because they have seven pairs of legs, so 14 legs, unlike an insect with six. They're actually a member of the crustacean family, like lobsters and crayfish. They like damp areas, dark areas, and they typically feed on decaying organic material. So they're not a bad thing to have in our gardens and our landscapes because they help with the breakdown of organic material. But they do like an occasional feeding of young, succulent plants and seedlings. So we do have to take some care when we're putting out new plants. Sometimes when I'm putting out things like lettuce that I know is going to be attractive to pill bugs, I start out a little bit in advance of planting my lettuce by reducing the number of pill bugs. And I'll do that with beer traps, just a simple coffee can, uh, cat food can or pie pan, something like that with just a little bit of beer in it sunk to the level of the soil will attract them and then they f fall in, drown and die and you can take care of them and get them out of the garden. Avoid having boards and uh, logs and, and other trash and debris in your yard because they'll tend to collect under those, those areas. But you can actually make traps like that. Uh, you can put uh, clay saucers in the ground with a little bit of potato or apple attract them and put that under a board and then that will attract a lot of them and you can kill them and get the numbers down in your garden. But again, once your plants get established, they're not going to be as tasty to the pill bugs. So it's really just an early planting uh, pest that you'll have to deal with. Now there are some things that you can use around the house that, that might be of help for you. Sometimes coffee grounds will help to repel them around seedlings. One of the secrets too is not to mulch plants too too early because having a thick layer of mulch around the plants will give them a hiding place and so it's best to let your plants get up and get established a little better and then pull the mulch up around them as the stems start to toughen off. You'll also benefit from watering more in the morning and not having the foliage really wet in the evening because that makes conditions uh, really nice for snails, slugs and pill bugs and can add to the number of problems that you have around your plants. Another thing that you can do is sprinkle diatomaceous earth around the plants, but I don't find that that has a long lasting effect. Even red pepper, hot red pepper, like cayenne pepper sprinkled around seedlings can also help you with uh, deterring the pill bugs. There are some commercial products available that are very uh, helpful and very effective. And one thing you can do is spray with orange oil, just a diluted orange oil sprayed on the surface 
surface of the soil and also to spray under those traps that you might put out on the garden will help reduce the numbers very quickly. The, um, the other product that you can use is the bioorganic spray. Some of these uh, sprays that use essential oils work very effectively on the pill bugs and sow bugs. And then another product that is really wonderful is Sluggo Plus. Now you may have heard of Sluggo being used for snails and slugs. This, this has the iron phosphate of Sluggo, but it also has the plus, which is spinosad, and that works very effectively on millipedes and pill bugs, sow bugs, all kinds of things. And the difference between a pill bug and a sow bug is the sow bugs tend to be a little bit flatter and they don't roll up into a ball like the pill bugs. So, uh, the Sluggo Plus breaks down into a fertilizer. It is a bit expensive, but you do get the benefit of having that insecticide control plus a little bit of fertilizer added to it. And you just sprinkle that lightly into the soil and it will give you a long lasting effect and get those numbers down. So wetter years, we're gonna have more problems with pill bugs. So be prepared for dealing with them when we're going to have uh, wet soil. Thanks, Tricia. For more tips, visit klru.org slash ctg. Next week, find out how to help wildlife through winter. Until then, I'll see you in the garden. Visit klru.org slash ctg to learn more about today's program, upcoming events, and to sign up for our electronic newsletter. Check out John's how-to tips and visit Trisha's Corner for ideas inside and out. Get growing at klru.org slash ctg.